Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. My name again is Don Brown. I'm uh, the founding director of the Data Science Institute, and uh, we're going to be talking about social media and uh, all sorts of analytics around social media during this session. And the way we're going to work it is we're going to have each one of our panelists give a uh, about a seven-minute uh, overview to uh, what they consider to be their work and the important aspects of uh, social media analytics. And then I'm going to ask them a couple of questions, and I'm going to open it up to you. And depending on how we go, uh, we'll, we'll keep rolling along with those, uh, that kind of question in open format session. Um, so we'll go ahead and start first with Krista Kennard um, uh, from IBM. I'm going to stand while I talk uh, because I tend to pace and I feel like my words make more sense as I walk and let the ideas come out. Uh, where are the slides? Slides. Slides coming. Okay. <laughs> Let's make sure our clicker works. There we go. All right. Uh, so hello, everyone. My name is Krista Kennard. I'm a senior analytics consultant with IBM Public Sector. Uh, and I want to open up, before we even talk about IBM or social media analytics, with this quote by Marie Curie. And she says, nothing in life is to be feared. It is only to be understood. Now is the time to understand more so that we may fear less. The last year has been a little bit rough in the news, and people have been openly expressing their fears and their worries about present events and how that's going to shape our future. And social media has and will continue to play a huge part in that. That's why I think that this quote by Marie Curie is so important for what we're going to talk about today. Because as data scientists, we have the tools to bring that understanding. And honestly, I would argue that we have the responsibility to bring that understanding. Um, and so I work for IBM, Watson AI, and data platforms in the public sector, meaning my clients are government clients, and sometimes we do work with, with some nonprofit organizations and state and local governments. Uh, I joined IBM in August. I recently graduated from Carnegie Mellon University with my master's in data analytics and public policy, and I'm particularly interested in how we use data science and machine learning for social good. I fundamentally believe that data-driven decision-making is a part of how we govern, is a critical part of how we develop and improve policy, of how we target social projects and how we understand and approach our ever-changing growing and growing society. Uh, that's what I studied, focused my studies on and that's what I do every day at IBM. So when I'm working with my team at IBM, whenever we talk about a data science solution for a client or a machine learning solution for a client, we always like to take a step back. So I think a lot of people think of IBM as kind of the old IBM, right? The men in the blue suits coming with big mainframes. That is not the IBM of today. And we are much more centered on user-focused design, right? So before I sit down with my team to write a single line of code, we take a step back and we go through this iterative process. And design thinking is how we approach problem solving so that we can think through how are our users going to use this technology? What is the impact of what we are developing? How is this going to make the world a better place? And how can this be used to really add value? Uh, and so, oops, my slides are going away. I really believe in this design thinking process and really try to use it in all of my projects because I think what it does is it brings together the very best of human ability, right? So humans are very good at solving moral questions, at using common sense, compassion, empathy, abstraction, dealing with dilemmas. And then we can combine that with the power of cognitive systems, which are really good at locating knowledge, pattern detection, natural language processing. That's really where we come up with solutions that are meaningful and thoughtful and help us get to the root of this responsible data science and making the world better with what we're doing. Uh, so that brings us to, well, what are you doing with social media at IBM? 
Uh, so I want to talk to you a little bit about the Watson Developer Cloud service and the Watson um, Developer Platform. So what that is, is it's this cohesive environment that we have pulled together a bunch of different APIs that you can use. And there are some interfaces that you can use if you just want to upload data and get some uh, social media data sp specifically and get uh, some analyses. So we have something called Watson uh, for social media analytics. We also have a tool called Blue Toss. And those are a lot more uh, interactive. So we have an interface where you can drop in data. You can see what are the most popular posts? Who's posting them? What are some trends within them? Where are they coming from? But you can also go into our Watson developer platform and build your own custom application. Uh, so you can go in and look at, if you want to look at text, for example. Uh, people are saying all kinds of different things on social media, Twitter, Facebook, whatever you want to say. You can go through and use some of our uh, our APIs to do sentiment analysis are what people are saying. Is it ar around a certain topic? Is it positive? Is it negative? Is it sarcastic? What are they saying? Uh, if you want to be able to trace the lineage of a tweet, right? After a tweet has been reposted a thousand times, it's really hard to find who started this originally. Was it a person? What was their intent? Or was it a bot? Right? And these are things that we can do through our platform. We can also look at images. Right? People are posting all kinds of different videos and images. So let's say you post an image about a cat in the tree. We can build an application that will also mine for posts about cats in a tree. Um, or if somebody posts a video, and that video has, say, text in it. Right? So if we're looking at a news feed, Right? If you have just even a screenshot of someone on the news, there is a ton of information there. There's text, there's what the person is saying, there's what you're seeing on the screen. We can go through and analyze every part of that and link it to our analysis of who's posting, what are they saying, what does that mean? Um, and so these are kind of some of the things that we have been working with so far. Uh, we have a lot of different projects, especially in MySpace, where we're working with the government. I think there's a lot of promising work to be done. That said, there is a lot more that needs to happen. And that's why IBM really focuses on their academic partnerships. Uh, so IBM is really looking for the next generation of data scientists, right? We need people with these skills. We need people with the passion. And I don't even mean this as in, IBM, right? Of course we need this, but as a society, we need more people who have the ability to critically think about how we look at information, how we digest this amount of information, and how we bring understanding to what's going on around us. And so IBM partners with, with universities in a couple of different ways. We do it in at the classroom level, uh, so we like to provide these services to instructors, to researchers, to actually be able to access these tools and use them to be able to make meaningful contributions, right? We are not the only people doing this. You guys have incredible ideas. You're doing really groundbreaking research. We want you guys to have cutting edge technology at your fingertips. The other way we're working with universities is at um, the administrative level, right? So there's a lot of room for using data science and analytics for working in things like student retention, right? Student engagement, understanding how your students are doing in classes, how they're feeling around their classes. So IBM is working with several different universities to kind of pull in what are students tweeting about their experience at their university? What are they posting on Facebook? in combination with their academic records and their demographic information. Um, and so that's why IBM is so committed to being here today, right? That's why they sent me to come talk to you. We really, really value what's coming out of universities, and we really want to see what your creativity can do. And ultimately, what we want at IBM is to be the bridge. There's so much happening in academia. I know, I was just there. But there's kind of this need to be able to bring it to clients, bring it to people who are using this every single day. So we want to be able to take what you guys are learning, what you guys are doing with your research, and put it into practice in the world. Uh, so thank you very much for having me here today, and I really look forward to the discussion we're going to have on the panel. Thank you very much, Krista. And uh, next we've got Kevin Driscoll from our Media Studies Department. Preview. Sorry, folks. It's okay. It's okay. All right. We're done. We're done. <laughs>
You got that? So my role here today is to talk a little bit about the ethical dimensions of the research that we're all doing and we're all interested in doing in the future. And a little bit of my background, my interest in looking at data collected through social media systems has tended to be about the relationship between <coughs> politics and popular culture. Politics as a manifestation of popular culture, how we use popular culture artifacts to express political opinions. It seems like social media is a good place to do that. And that has put me in touch with a really interesting conversation about ethics that pushed me out of my comfort zone and beyond my training. And so it's kind of a tough road to walk. Sometimes the ethics person in the room is the one seen as like raining on the parade. So I had a colleague who used to joke that I was the ethics police. And they'd be like, oh, got to stop talking about our new project. Ethics police are here. And they could imagine ethics as something that happens after research design. So if I have a takeaway for you, it's that ethics is part of your research design. If it has not been overtly a component of the conversations you're having, then you have given up the responsibility, and that was an ethical choice that you made as a team. If we include ethics as the way that we design our research and select our methodologies, then we actually strengthen our research outcomes. You don't arrive at the conclusion of your study and then try to figure out what the ethics were. You have been considering the ethical implications of the work each step of the pro process. So you arrive with greater confidence about the things that you want to say, the arguments you want to make, the observations that you want to share with your intellectual community. So the topic invites some reflection about the very idea of ethics. So we ask what this word means. We could go back to some of the documents you learn about in graduate school when you get your training, such as the Belmont Report. And that gets us so far, except that in my experience, and I think a lot of folks would have the same, when I bring my research proposals for institutional review, they are all exempt, that they don't require close ethical analysis. Often I'm looking at things people voluntarily shared in a public-facing platform. And yet I know from working in this field and being a domain expert that they are not exempt, that there are issues here about ethics, about values, about social norms that have not yet been institutionalized. So it turned out that the, re the researcher kind of has to hold themselves to a higher standard than the institutional review board may enforce. You can think then of the IRB standards as maybe like the first step towards a greater understanding of the ethical implications of the research we're doing. This isn't really unique to social media. It's true of any emerging field of research worth doing, that the ethical questions that will really shape the future of that field will come up in the process of doing the work. So as we become experts in the field and develop new methods, we're also becoming experts in new risks and new potential for harm. That is simply not known, not well documented. So there are some people that are doing this, and there is a community that I thought I could share a little bit of information with you about. Uh, a, an area that, or a group that's been very helpful for me is the Ethics Working Committee of the Association of Internet Researchers. And since 2002, they've published uh, sets of guidelines to help students and teachers and researchers kind of develop an ethical expertise around their research. One document that you'll find at this URL, which is aoir.org slash ethics, is a single page that lists almost like a, a flow chart of questions that you might ask about the research you hope to do. And in my experience, using this kind of approach and sharing it with students and colleagues is by the end, you feel like you have a stronger research question. It is reshaping the project that you intended to do by forcing yourself to reflect through this process. And the kind of driving authors of the report talk about research guidelines rather than codes or standards. And they choose the term guidelines purposively to say that in an emerging field where the questions are still being uncovered, then the kinds of ethics that we must consider will be also reflexible, uh, re flexible, responsive, adaptable to the changing conditions. And the word that they prefer is context. So they focus a lot on the ethical conditions of the context in which the work will be taking place. They ask how you define this context. This is like the boundary of what's in play for the research you're doing. What matters? Who's in there? Who can get there? How do you access it? And then the context of circulation of the outcomes of your research. 
which is I think where we will go momentarily, but how do we imagine presenting these findings? Who are the audiences? What levels of expertise do we expect them to have? What ethical commitments do we demand of these audiences? A book that, you, that has just, just appeared in September from uh, a number of different researchers contributing from the same community is titled Internet Research Ethics for the Social Age. It's open access. There's a PDF that you can download and read the book. Kind of another way into this conversation of leveling up your ways of thinking about ethics in your research. And to end, I thought I would throw out some provocations that can drive some discussion for us. I think we approach this research thinking of social media as something like either a reflection, an extension, or maybe a distortion of social reality. Otherwise, why would we do the research? It's got to mean something. So we're baking into that assumption something about reality. And when we do our research, any validity failures that we would have in our research design will then have social consequences in the real world for the people who are generating these traces that we subject to our analyses. So we can think of another way of doing this that when we do social media research, we're not merely studying a reality, but producing the next iteration of that reality. There is kind of a back and forth in this research cycle. So a few important questions. The typical validity type of question, are you measuring what you think that you're measuring? We know, for example, that there are accounts circulating on any social media platform that are automated to some extent. They are there to deceive or mimic or uh, uh, troll, you could say, undermine our research efforts. So our any validity question would start from like, is the thing we're measuring actually in the data or are we misrepresenting something about the social world? This could go to another a more precise question to ask. Do you make assumptions like one social media account corresponds to one human being in the world? Uh, we know, for example, there are groups of people who go to work every day and part of their work is piloting a whole team of fake accounts to make comments on different things and shape the ways that public opinion might form around different issues. Similarly, we wanna know, are we looking at these services or these platforms in a way that reflects the real lived phenomenological experience of a user. So if you think of yourself looking at the home screen of your smartphone, there's an array of apps there. Can you really reflect the social reality of that person studying only Twitter or looking only at Facebook posts? We think about the 2016 election as like a social media driven phenomenon, yet many of the artifacts you find on social media platforms are video clips from 24 hour cable news or links to newspaper articles. So how could we really understand these systems in isolation? Another place that we see this is in second screening or live tweeting connected viewing. If you didn't know what was on TV at the time that, in, that a message was sent, you may not really have the context for understanding the meaning of that message. A way that this happens a lot when we collaborate across industry and academia is taking for granted certain ontological characteristics of the platforms themselves. And that's a kind of fancy way to say, do you take for granted the names of the fields in the database? If it says location, can we say that that is location? Or what other steps do we have to take to test or post-process the data we get so that we feel confident about the categories that we're using in our analyses? We want to feel some degree of trust in our tooling. And uh, I kind of always think back to this episode of Star Trek when Spock is so upset and then wistfully says that the instruments can only measure the things that they were designed to measure. Our instruments are subject to the same limits. And so we should demand of the tools that we use some degree of transparency and documentation about how the data are brought together and organized and presented back to us as researchers before we then take that to our own audiences. Last two points here, do we take terms of service to be informed consent? This is an easy step for us to take. It seems legally true. The person clicked the checkbox, and yet all work and all of our uh, anecdotal experience would suggest that nobody actually reads these documents. They're in no way informed or consenting to the activities that are taking place there. And this means that we may unwittingly launder data for bad actors, that we may play a role in a circuit of misinformation and propaganda that does real damage in the social world. 
not because of any lapse on our own part, but because we are presenting a kind of game to the world that can be manipulated, that can be turned towards uh, socially undesirable ends. And so while we can produce beautiful images and dashboards that make sense of the world in a certain sort of way, these are seen by certain bad actors as gameable systems that can be used to launder misinformation or rumors in other sorts of ways to give them credibility and credence in the public sphere. And we may play some small intermediary role in that, however unwittingly. So for better or worse, I think as we move into 2018, we must think of social media systems as hostile environments for researchers that we approach with some a, a degree of defensiveness, that we anticipate these problems. Because, as I mentioned before, taking this extra care in our work will actually strengthen the arguments and the observations we're able to make. Thank you very much. Okay, our next Hello. speaker is uh, Rafael Alvarado, who's at Data Science Institute. He's an anthropologist in the Data Science sure. Institute. So. All right, so I, I'm gonna sit if that's okay. Um, can we have uh, the slides on? Yeah, go to the next one, please. Yes, please. Oh, I'll do that, yeah. Does that work? I'm gonna point this. There we go. All right, so what I'm gonna do is, um, my interest is in cultural analytics, broadly conceived, and I'm going to give you a quick vignette of why cultural analytics matters in this subject domain. Um, the main thing is that if you think about social media analytics, it's really about modeling the relationship between language and human behavior. Uh, that's at the very highest level. That's not, you know, it, it doesn't uh, lay any particular claim to that. A lot of social scientists try to do that. But Social media analytics specifically does try to do that, and specifically it's trying to correlate things like tweets and posts and other forms of contextualized human behavior, as it's sometimes called, or discourse, and social action, right? And the concept of culture is actually something that was developed long ago by social anthropologists, cultural anthropologists, and other social scientists to precisely connect those two domains. Uh, so language and behavior are connected by means of culture. This goes back to Max Weber, 19th century German sociology, where the idea is that humans do not just behave in a responsive, stimulus response way, but almost every human action is mediated by worldview or some kind of cognitive model. And so when we talk about culture, what we're talking about are things like mental maps and models, cognitive maps, uh, symbols and meanings, as it's sometimes called. So one of my specific research interests is on internet-mediated identity and social action. And I'm specifically interested in nationalism and uh, di different nationalist movements because they're, there's, they're a phenomenon that's actually very closely associated with the rise of the internet going back to 1994 and the Zapatista rebellion in Chiapas, Mexico. Um, and what I do is I apply text analytic me methods to those, uh, to those particular sites broadly conceived. I'm not talking specifically just about social media. I'm talking about homegrown news sites uh, and social media and, and mainstream sites because in reality, those form a single public sphere which uh, the elements of which notoriously feed off one another. Uh, the, there is no such thing as just blogging and social media and news. They're all, all those channels are constantly reading each other and reacting to each other and you have to treat those as kind of like a, a single ecology. And so what I want to do today is just quickly show you a couple of examples of the application of a, of a pretty basic uh, data scientific method called topic modeling, uh, the, 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 the standard form of which is LDA, latent Dirac clay allocation, coupled with uh, some post-processing of that data using a concept, uh, a conditional probability, a very basic concept from, uh, from your probability class, which is related to uh, something else called mutual information. I'm going to apply this to uh, some news sites. Uh, and the idea is that when you do this, you can detect social events, uh, which are singular or recurring instances of social action. And I do want to issue, uh, this is not a joke, a trigger warning, uh, because every example I'm going to show you deals in some level with violence and something uh, that's a little bit distasteful. Um, the first example I want to show you, and first of all, just explain the, the, the structure of the slide. This is a composite of a topic model browser that I've written uh, that uh, is designed to let users explore a topic model and the content that it me it's meant to model. And on the left, and on the, uh, on, yeah, the upper left and on the left side, you'll see the words associated with the topic model. On the, in the graph, you'll see the, the trend of that topic over time. Uh, then you'll see in the upper right an example post. It's just one, one post among many 
of things that have been classified as, as belonging to that topic or in which that topic is mixed at a high proportion. And in the bottom, you'll see what I call the three most contiguous topics uh, in terms of their conditional probability related to the, the topic in question. Uh, and what you can see here very simply, this is a very a dramatic one in terms of the, the time uh, uh, series. You can see that uh, every five years, uh, and actually let me, let me uh, frame this. This is uh, a topic model developed from a corpus of news articles from the website Anfoblacht, which is a, an Irish Republican uh, news site that goes back to 1995. So I have every article they've published since 95 up to 2016. And you'll see that um, every five years, the topic hunger, hunger strike trends. Uh, which is very interesting, you know, why would that happen? Um, and what you can see is the related topics by mutual information or by conditional probability uh, point out that this actually, this topic co-occurs co with the topic of commemoration. And as a social anthropologist, you say, oh yeah, this is actually an example of what we might call social drama, uh, where human behavior is me mediated by uh, uh, what the anthropologist Marshall Solomons calls a mythical reality. It's an historical metaphor of a mythical reality. They're, they're, they're reproducing this commemorative event every five years, and it's, it's important to their identity as being Irish Republicans. So the second one is a model developed from a, uh, a news site called Tamilnet, which is associated with the now vanquished Tamil Tiger Movement uh, in Sri Lanka, uh, also from 1995 to 2016. It's significant that a lot of these sites start in 95. Uh, uh, when people realize that the web can be used to present nationalist movements and things like that. And what we see is a trend for a topic associated with the practice of white van abductions, uh, which peaks at the year preceding the defeat of the Tamil Tigers in 2009. And you will also see correlated with, those, uh, with that topic is the topic of human rights and also specific topics within Sri Lanka. And this one is closer to home. Uh, where you'll see uh, this is a, a model developed from a, a corpus of, of posts from a site called It's Going Down, which is an alleged anarchist and Antifa website uh, that <coughs> purportedly goes back to 2006 to 2017, but really most of the data is from 2016 and 2017. And what this shows is the cor there's a topic called neo -Nazi, you know, that is clearly associated with neo-Nazis and white supremacists, uh, and you can see it uh, spiking in August of 2017. I think we all know what that means. Uh, and you'll see that it's related to the topics of Richard Spencer, uh, Facebook, and uh, Charlottesville, uh, a specific event in Charlottesville. Um, and basically, all I want to do is just show you that in each case, you know, what you can do with the topic model and uh, ap apply to these particular media is that these media forms become essentially social sensors. And human beings are kind of like social diodes who transduce information about what's happening on the ground. And you get this aggregate view that then you can then visualize. And it's subject to all of the, I just want to echo what, you're, what you said about subject to all the qualms about uh, the nature of that data, whether you know, there's huge selection bias going on, there's huge ontological trust in the data model that when you're, you're putting these things up. Uh, but at the end of the day, you do have some notion of a sensor, however distorted, of social reality happening. But also what's interesting to me is that it sheds light on the structures of those social uh, events and actions by looking at conditional probabilities of how topics are related to each other. And as an anthropologist, the notion of cultural structure is very interesting to me, and this looks like it's promising for being able to explore that. And I'll stop there. Great. Yeah, sure. Uh, so great to be with you all. Um, my name, like you said, Matt Gerber. I'm over in systems engineering. Um, just a little backstory while the slides come up uh, to give you a sense of where this this topic came from. Um, for many years, Don had been sorry. For many years, Don had been uh, with his students going back into the '90s, building statistical models of the space and time influences on crime. Uh, and their outcomes. Um, and while that was going on, right up to 2011, I had been uh, toiling away in computer science, work working on computational semantics of natural language processing, uh, really with no application in mind at all. Um, and so I eventually ended up here. Um, and Don and I were wondering, well, how do we, what, how do we bring these together? What form would that take? What would it look like? And what might we learn? Um, and so for many years, uh, now going back to 2011, um, our students and myself and others have been working at this intersection. Um, so my goal here is to 
maybe just stimulate some ideas about what this looks like. I'm not going to take the time to go into results. We have a whole bunch of papers that give you all the detail you want and more. Um, uh, so Kevin, take a deep breath uh, and, and let's talk about uh, social media and crime. Um, so in our work on this, we've had in mind primarily two very high level objectives. Um, police forces, public safety agencies uh, have a major resource allocation problem in terms of given a city like Chicago, um, how many folks from Chicago? Okay, so we've been studying your city. Uh, so given a city like Chicago, which is shown uh, just the outline on the left, uh, the police are in some ways interested in this resource allocation problem of where do we deploy resources. Um, and for many years, Don and his colleagues have been working on this prediction problem, right, to go from the left to the right. Uh, because if we can get good predictions, the idea is <coughs> we can more effectively allocate these resources that are very expensive, very scarce. Um, so objective two, beyond just resource allocation, um, interpreting the factors, whether they are spatial factors, temporal factors that produce these crime outcomes that ultimately give us the ability to make predictions um, and understand what's going on. So here's Pritzker Park. So it's the same scene, just two different days, two different times. Uh, in the top left, there's nothing going on. In the bottom right, there's a major event. Um, so the whole point here is that's the same location, um, but the dynamics there as regards crime outcomes are dramatically different. Okay, and so a lot of our work with social media uh, has in some ways tried to explain this difference, right? What, is, what are the dynamics that are differing between these two um, captured through the lens of social media, okay? So just a bit, bit about the crime side. So this is our, our outcome data, at least in Chicago, and many, many large cities like Chicago, LA, New York, um, provide this data free of charge to everybody uh, in the interest of transparency. Um, so at the end, what we get is a large set of crime records with time, type, location uh, that has been filtered uh, successively through all of these events, right? So if a crime occurs and if it's reported uh, and if the police show up and if they determine that something has happened um, and if we maintain that belief on into time, that record will be in our data set, okay? Otherwise, no. So these are the sorts of data that we get um, from 2011 till today, around six and a half million of these records. Uh, there's location information here anonymized to the block level, right? So we don't get latitude, longitude precisely. We get it at the block level, uh, which can be very disclosing, to be honest. If there's nobody living around you within two blocks, well, we know who it is uh, that it happened near, okay? Uh, so those are the outcome data. And here's Here's the intuition about what we had when we looked at this problem. Uh, we have the crime data. We, we know where it happened, roughly. We know when. Uh, we also have social media in the form of tweets. Okay? And we have GPS tag tweets for a very small proportion of those. Okay? Uh, so there's a lot of figures out there, but in the single digits, percentage-wise, uh, of tweets having these more or less very precise GPS coordinates attached to them. Okay. Subject to the issues of GPS sensors and phones and buildings nearby, right? We've got GPS coordinates on them. At the time we were gathering these for, sh for Chicago, uh, we were gathering in around 25,000 a day, right? Initially I'd have looked at Charlottesville, but nothing tweet-wise happens much here. In terms of GPS tagged tweets, uh, Chicago was much more profitable. Um, so we gather the tweet information um, and building on all the work that Don and his students and colleagues had done over the years, uh, leveraging these other layers of spatio-temporal information, we build machine learning models, right? We build statistical models of crime outcomes for the two dozen or so types of crime that Chicago catalogs, uh, rolling up all of the information from public infrastructure, streets, buildings, hospital locations, police department locations, uh, some demographic layers. We have the historical crime, and now we have tweets. Uh, we pinned those down to their GPS coordinates. We apply topic modeling uh, to create a space of predictors to explain crime outcomes. Okay. So we did this 
uh, for quite a long time. And again, I don't have results here. If you're curious, just email me. I'll link you to all the papers you could ever want. Um, but what we ended up concluding from doing this um, is that there is a signal in here above and beyond the historical density of crime, above and beyond all the spatiotemporal layers of information we had in all of the evaluations we've run, uh, depending on the crime type, the Twitter content adds, uh, adds accuracy to our predictive models, right? Uh, which was interesting to us. My initial hypothesis was there can't be anything there as regards crime. Uh, but for certain crime types, there is a substantial amount of information. Um, we don't, I don't have a, a theory of why, mechanistically why that is improving the predictions. Um, all we know is that it does uh, according to the evaluations that we've run empirically. Um, so our focus, um, our focus has been, just to give you a sense of what we were trying to predict, we weren't trying to say classify individual accounts as criminals. Uh, the media loved this and the first thing they asked me always was, how do you figure out who's a criminal and who's not? Uh, the unit of analysis was geographic space at some resolution, uh, not individual accounts. Um, so what we found, like others have said, Twitter is a bizarre sort of lens to look through uh, in many ways with all the bias and everything else that's been mentioned. The same holds here as well. Um, and where we've gone from here is, uh, is to look at other sensing modalities. So Twitter, in my view, was always this very strange sensor that we placed on people's phones because that's where all the data came from. They were GPS tagged predominantly by smartphones. Um, and it got me thinking, well, there are 10 other, 10 other sensors on the phone. Why can't we collect those data as well? Um, and of course, we can't do this for the public. It would be too invasive. Um, but it did get us started thinking about sensing human behavior and how that impacts risk and perception of risk and health, health outcomes and safety outcomes. Um, and this is really where all of that started, was looking at crime through the lens of social media. So uh, thank you, and I look forward to the discussion. Thanks. Thanks. So I'm actually going to go in reverse order. I'm going to start with you, Matt, <laughs> since you just got done talking, and ask you a, a quick question. It's actually about what you just ended with, because I think uh, what I'm interested in hearing from you is you are now extending your work into areas where you're actually using, you know, we'll call it Internet of Things kind of uh, devices and, and, you know, mobile devices and combining it. Can you t say a little bit about this combination of social media data with other data that we're getting from yeah, the mobile absolutely. devices? Um, this is on. Um, so, yeah, the way I view this, all of this work now is. this now is that social media is just one stream of, of data in the set of streams from all of the sensors that we carry around. Um, so it, it helps to characterize in a way um, some things that people are thinking and planning to do or have done. Um, but now we complement that with uh, other sensors on a phone for physical activity, for physiology, uh, for very localized, like within a building, uh, readings, um, and our interest now is to understand human behavior and health and well-being outcomes using all of those sensor data. Um, so it's much more intrusive, I would say, the kind of thing we're looking at now. Uh, we have to be f uh, far more concerned about what we do with the data we collect. Um, not that we weren't concerned about the Twitter data, um, but now we're getting heart rate, we're getting all sorts of potentially very sensitive data streams in to under, understand these outcomes. Um, and social media is just one of those now amongst many that we have potential access to uh, through the phones and other devices that we carry around every day. Uh, and that's where we've gone. Yep. Um, Raph, what's his? Yes. Raph, uh, you know, I, I'm familiar with your tool. It's an awesome tool, but it is, uh, you know, uh, one way of looking at things. And I guess I'm curious with regard to what you're doing is how do you actually start to handle some of these problems of bias? How do you expand 
uh, the range of a tool like that to be able to really look at a lot of the other features in social media because let's face it, uh, topic modeling is, uh, you know, in, in the world of data science where an epoch is, uh, you know, time is a year or maybe two mm -hmm. years, your topic modeling is a couple epochs old now. Right. And so we're, we're in a word of Vec and other things. What do you see as the way to extend this to make it, you know, you've given us really cool results, but what's the next steps with, this, with regard to this that are going to get us to the well, next way to visualize this? The thing that I find, I, it's, an old, it's an old tool, but I think it's, it's not been used to the degree that it can be used. And I think one of the things that I still find fascinating about it is, is the ability to apply post-process uh, conditional uh, uh, mutual information models to the topics where the idea is that each document can be seen as a shopping basket and the selection of topics in that shopping basket can be subject to association rules and that can be used to surface cultural networks. That's, that's the idea. The other thing is to uh, continue to track the development of topic models because now the LDA uh, approach is, is being replaced by other approaches, correlational topic models and things like that. And, but to speak to your first thing, my view is this is just one channel of information. And the idea is to get as many channels of, of information through different means, such as, you know, word embedding, as you, as, as you mentioned, and so forth. But also, on the interpretation side, one of the things I've noticed about most data science projects is that there is this uh, big, messy part at the beginning, which is all about the acquisition of data and the production of data, the curating of data. There's a wonderful phrase used this morning by the speaker about curating a world with that data, which I think is a brilliant way of thinking about it. And then there's this clean, swivel chair, white coat world of analytics, right? Where you're applying all your methods and you get your cool results back. And then the suits get hold of it, or the people who are trying to do the interpretation, professors or so forth, and it comes back to this messy world of mapping things onto interpretive models and so forth. And you'll find people, I see this all the time when people are doing sentiment analysis, you'll find at the end, in the conclusion, some casual reference to, oh yeah, this makes a lot of sense because when human beings were being developed in the, in the Paleolithic period, they would have done this. And that's <laughs> total nonsense, right? There's, uh, there's a lot of interpretive stuff that happens at the end where you're piecing this together and, and synthesizing a narrative that is a conclusion. And that's where you have to subject the, the results of something like Polo, which is the name of the tool I was showing you, to severe interpretive constraint, right? You have to be very critical of that, and you have to look at it relative to other uh, sources of data and, and outputs that you've gotten, and it comes back to good old interpretation and sort of scientific thinking. Um, so that's how I condition it. It's, I, I don't see it as like, it's not a palantir, yeah. or maybe it is a palantir. <laughs> it shows you truth, but you better, uh, you, you better be aware that it's limited. It's, it's truthy, is that what they were, we were hearing this morning? Okay, um, so Kevin, you, you've got us thinking about a lot of things, I gotta say. Um, taking the side of, uh, at least, I mean, a lot of people are arguing, uh, many of these concerns, you know, are just, we're not gonna worry about them, we're gonna go forward and do it. And I mean, it gets to the, the, the very simple argument that says, look, everybody in the US knows that anything that's free, you're the product, you know? And this actually goes back to the age of television. So, I mean, the argument is, is that we've, we've been dealing with this for a long time with various media outlets, many of the issues that you've brought up. So I guess my question to you is, so what is it about social media now that's truly new in this world of, uh, you know, this thing? Because, again, the United States has this really uh, laissez-faire attitude toward it, much more than Europe, or I mean, who we use as an example, or exemplar about thinking about the ethical and the moral issues around the use of media like this. This is a great frame to use, and I have two thoughts. First, the first thought is I actually don't make any assumptions about what people in America know, and that's a good rule of thumb. Uh, so I actually think a lot of people are still would be engaged by the thought that they are the product for a social media platform, but that uh, is an interesting background question. A more uh, one that is inspiring to me in this area is that we have asked a lot of the first round of questions of these kinds of systems and haven't yet gone to what are the really interesting questions that are available to us. So in my own kind of subfield of political communication, to think of Twitter as a proxy for public opinion is, was a first step that people might have thought, oh, we can... People are watching a debate and we can see what they're saying about it. That's something we tried to do random digit dialing and things like that before. Turned out that it was a terrible proxy for public opinion because of the uneven adoption of the 
the system across the population and all these other uh, biases. However, it reveals this other much more interesting space of questions, which would be, how do we see this platform? How are other actors that we weren't considering observing this platform differently from us and seeing it as a tactical space where they can insert their marginal voices into a mainstream conversation? So I kind of arrive at this metaphor of data laundering through the, those observations to say, there is a proximity here between institutions of power and marginal actors that didn't exist before. So a very marginal idea can become on the radar or the agenda of public opinion institutions in a way that wasn't possible before. So now the types of questions we ask are more complex, they're harder, they require us to engage different literatures that they might have otherwise. But moving past the first step question was necessary and I found that the ethical concerns were the way to move into the more interesting questions, was they required you to think beyond your first instinct. Yeah, great point, excellent. Um, Krista, yeah, so we are now working with IBM on a project here. In fact, we're looking at the, the one that uh, Raf mentioned. Uh, we're, we're looking at social media as it related to incidents like occurred in Charlottesville in August. Um, and IBM's been great, but frankly, it's, it's a little bit like what you just showed us. You got a lot of stuff that's available to do it. If you had to, for this audience, if you had to narrow it down to the, to the tool or tools, just a couple that you would say, if you want to get into this social media area and really exploit it, what would you, what would you offer up as IBM's, uh, you know, the key things that you, you should, you sh we should look at from you? Sure. Uh, you're right. There is a lot of a lot of offerings, and it's because IBM does a lot of things. Uh, but I would say, and I, uh, I was kind of briefed a little bit about, about the project that's going on. The biggest tool you're probably going to want to look at is the um, already existing kind of structure of either Watson for social analytics or Blue Toss. Uh, and those are pulling directly from Twitter as we uh, kind of live, and you can search. Um, it's pretty easy to go in and say, all right, I want to look at tweets about, um, I don't know, white supremacy, or I want to look at tweets that Trump has said about Charlottesville, right? And you can just go in and kind of search, and it will give you this, it gives you this nice dashboard analysis, and you can pick and choose what you want to look at uh, without necessarily having to, to program anything or make any, any complex API calls. So I think that's really the best tool, and I, I know you guys are also working with the data science experience, um, and so those tie in, in very nicely. So you can, you can actually make those, those talk to each other to be able to, to do the analyses you want to do. Okay, I'm going to open it up now for questions from uh, from you all. So if you raise your hand, I'll get you the microphone here. Yeah. Hi, um, I'm Laura, uh, and I have a question for you. And the question is, I mean, you're telling us that you are in a EBM are development tools for government, right? And one of the questions is, what what is government? What might government be able to do with the data, with that very specific data that you're gathering? In, in the different projects you are working on. So the question is like a combination between Kevin and, and Krista, like how do you develop these tools to be by themselves respectful with privacy, given that you're giving that information and that analysis to government, right? So how do you control that government don't do bad uses of the data you are providing them? Like are you taking, in, taking that in, into, into your designing process or something like that? Uh, well, so the first answer to that is there are laws, right? There, there's regulation as to how data is shared, how data is collected, uh, and things like that. And so whenever IBM is, is working with this type of data, of course, we're always in compliance with, with laws. Uh, and the second part of that, I think, points to IBM's culture of diversity. And so one thing that I really love about my team is even though we're a small team, we have, I don't know, eight or 10 different countries represented on our team. We have over 20 different languages that are spoken on our team. We have people from all kinds of backgrounds ranging from just out of undergrad to mid-career professionals to PhDs who have been in the field for, for 30 years. Uh, and I think having that kind of diversity of experiences and ideas really brings 
a lot of good questions to the table. And that design thinking process makes you ask those questions, right? So you are developing a solution, right? We're always trying to get to what does our client need? How is this going to add value to the client? But because we go through this iterative process, we do some development and then we, we look back, right? And we go back around and we ask these questions. What are we building? How is this being used? Is, is this going to be used in the way that we intended it to be used? And I think that's where we catch a lot of those kind of ethical questions that you're talking about, right? Are we protecting people? Are we in compliance with federal regulation? Are we doing something that could lead to social evil rather than social good? Did you want to say anything? I would say a recommendation for a, a, doc, a publication that's been a model for me of a high watermark of creating research in an academic setting that can speak to a, a broad range of readers, including policymakers, is a report called Beyond the Hashtags. And it, one of the authors of the report is a professor in my department, Professor Meredith Clark, among others. And uh, they use a range of methods that go from participant observation and interviews to large-scale analytics of social media data, and but their audience are people who are trying to understand something really complicated, which is Black Lives Matter. And so their audience and their way, their way of writing the, the research is really unique, and it, for me has been kind of a mark of success of trying to speak across different boundaries. And so if you're looking for models to, to work from, I think Beyond the Hashtags is a report to look for. Okay, so now I'm confused what I was going to say. But um, for Krista, I'm interested in telemedicine in Watson. Myself, personally, I don't know if there is a possibility of working with your doctor and or your provider on sort of a PowerPoint in telemedicine and then having Watson actually interpret it. That was my invention, but I'm thinking about that. And I, th I, I was wondering what has progressed in terms of that and um, working, you know, I know about the cloud and how people are putting things into the information source instead of working on their own behalf and that sort of thing. And then also for, um, I wanted to know the idea of, oops. <laughs> um, oh yeah, so how did WikiLeaks and the NSA historical snafus with, you know, working with people's information affect you all, I guess, in terms of um, how you proceed? You know, I mean, do you look at that historically and see defamation and things like that that happened with WikiLeaks and NSA? Okay. Do you want me to start with uh, Watson Health? Uh, so I'm only going to be able to give you a general answer because I don't work for Watson Health. Um, I work for Watson in the public space, in public sector. Um, I do know that what you're talking about is well on its way. Uh, so in, within Watson Health, they are working very closely with doctors, with researchers to be able to bring this type of technology to the bedside. Uh, and I, I cannot give you the latest example. Uh, as I said, I, I don't work for Watson Health, but I know it's really cool. So you should definitely look into it. Um, a lot of you guys talked about sentiment analysis at different points in, in your projects. And I was curious, it seems like with some commercially available products that do social media sentiment analysis, if you actually do the drill down and you get into what they're doing, it's really keyword analysis based on these posts that people have done and the, um, the methodology that they use to extrapolate meaning from those keywords is sometimes a little not great. Like sometimes they don't pick up on sarcasm or they don't know this is critical, you know, uh, this is not critical, this is positive, not positive. And I was curious whether you think that that is sort of like a baked in flaw in a lot of like the sentiment analysis tools that are out there and whether you see any emerging technologies that'll get better about automated reading of human and nuance in keyword analysis. Uh, 
kind of a kind of a no. We, we haven't looked at it, but it's a good question of why. Um, so in the work that we've done at the intersection of crime and social media, topic modeling is all we've done. Um, primarily because I had no preconceived notions of what I should be looking for. Um, and sentiment is a very specific task with a lot of extremely difficult, subtle issues to deal with. Um, so it seemed like a bad first place to start. Um, just looking at terms and topics uh, made more sense. Uh, that's not to say it wouldn't be interesting to look at. I think it would be, but we haven't gotten that far. Sure, sure. I, just a second. Let me, let me, let me ask a question. Uh, yes. So I feel like in the, especially in the realm of social media, there's lots of uh, ethical um, questions uh, just by the nature of it. Um, that might, you alluded to, uh, one of you alluded to earlier, how there's all sorts of um, standards around like conducting your research in the academic field, but that's you know, still kind of uh, nebulous in the uh, social media data science area. Similarly, like traditional model building, like for credit scores or the like, it's very, uh, or lending decisions, like it has to be very transparent, very highly regulated. Do you think that that sort of thing could be coming into this sort of social media research, or is there a sort of like industry, like even just like personal internal to a single company, like best practices to maybe avoid that sort of an outcome, or particular things people should be looking for to avoid in those sort of areas? It's actually very difficult to talk about this in, in broad strokes. And I think the credit score example is a good one to begin from because the credit score, while it is has problems for sure, it's kind of clear what the applications were intended to be of the credit score, what social problems it ought to ha have solved. You can sort of see the emergence of the credit score as a technology of society meeting some gap. Here we're thinking more speculatively about it turned out we had access to these data, and now we're going from that toward problems and questions, which is a little bit of a different direction. So one way to think about it is we probably in the near future will take for granted social media types of data as data that exists and think of it more in a, a range of uh, resources that are available to us when we have problems to solve. And it, wouldn't be as likely to convene a conversation around this whole messy category of data, and the conversations would be more problem-driven. That's my guess. Um, I just had a comment, and I couldn't see who was talking about the sentiment, but um, who was that? Just, okay, there you are, so I can at least look at you. <laughs> um, my name is M.G. Anderson. I represent IBM Software into the Commonwealth of Virginia. Um, and the, the Wat you know, Watson is a huge, huge, um, machine learning, you know, mach uh, machine, right? <laughs> and they've been using um, sentiment, they built a lot of the sentiment logic and then um, that Watson has been learning in the commercial space with call centers because it's so iterative. And they've, they're breaking through a lot of that sarcasm and things that um, you can, you know, Watson is learning by what happens next and then using history to try and keep perfecting it and fine tuning it. And in call centers, uh, when someone's talking on the phone, they get a bad answer, it's voice rises, somebody gets mad, they get sarcastic sometimes. That's where it's really learned. I don't know how much they're applying that back um, to like crime and social media, but it's gotta happen. You know, it's gotta be a bridge that will naturally be made because that's not so iterative. You know, that's an event and it's, and it's way past it that you get to use what you, what you learned. It's always looking back. What did it mean and trying to predict in the future? But the call center is really iterative, and all this sentiment logic is being built in Watson so that they can apply it to other areas. We'll take um, one more, which, okay. Uh, well, we'll, I, we'll I can actually ahead. add to what she was saying. Is this still on? So within Watson, we have something, again, using that exact same data called the Tony Analyzer. Uh, again, it doesn't necessarily make predictions, but it's kind of this tool that we have pulled together based on all of this research that they were doing where you can put in an email, you can put like any kind of text you want to put in there, even if it was speech to text, uh, and be able to, to analyze what the tone in that was. Uh, and it's actually pretty cool if you go in and you compare 
Uh, my personal favorite is to compare inaugural speeches. Uh, you can absolutely see what is the different tone, what is the sentiment, what is what were the emotions conveyed by these speeches. Go ahead. Great. Uh, I have a, qu a quick question about process. Uh, I'm going to direct this to Matthew, although I think everyone up here is going to be going to have an opinion. Uh, the question is uh, when selecting data, uh, and I'll use your work with your predictive analysis, I think one of the end goals early on was to figure out where the resource allocation for policemen in Chicago were gonna, was going to go. So with, with that end goal in mind, I'm sure it already sounds like you grabbed all kinds of other layers of data besides the five or six that you shared with us today. So whenever you grab data, um, you're really grabbing a whole lot of work and labor for yourself, so you don't want to waste your time. Um, some of it's biased, some of it's ethically a problem. Um, so what, do you have a kind of process that you go through when, you, when you're looking at making a better, a better predictive model, in your case, so that you spend your time on the right data? Uh, and if so, where do you start? Do you start with ethics? Do you start with, is there a bias? Do you start if it's public or private, and is there a cost? So if you could talk a little about the, how that process um, works for you, it would be interesting. Sure. Um, so starting with the selection, um, you know, the first thing we, I guess, we had to do is commit to using the crime data as true. And it's obviously not in a complete sense. Um, and once we've committed to that, then the question is, which of all of these other layers are we going to bring to bear on those outcomes? Um, and, you know, in a city like Chicago with hundreds of layers of information, it's not infeasible to look at all of them uh, in, even in an infrastructure like Ravana, like we have here at UVA. Uh, which is small compared to what you can spin up on AWS, um, you're able to do variable selection over all of that, um, in addition to all of the topic modeling work. So we haven't been so hampered uh, in terms of we just can't look at all of the end data sets. We have to look at a subsample of them. Uh, we've been able to do variable selection over all of those. Um, and to answer the bias question, they almost certainly are, but I, I don't know to what extent they are, um, and we haven't dealt with that in a formal way. We've taken the layers that come out of Chicago as predictors, uh, and as long as they give us better predictions in the outcome, we've been satisfied. Yeah, yeah so I wanted to ask a question a little bit more in kind of the space of collaboration. I know a lot of people are talking about um, collaboration between like platforms and researchers and independent developers in making data more open source and making software itself more open source. But then I'm kind of curious because simultaneously there have been these trends in kind of like adversarial neural networks and like malicious uses of public data um, that, for example, create bots that are harder to identify. And I'm kind of curious within that balance what you guys think are kind of the best emerging practices in managing the development of socially progressive data science, specifically in orientation to make things still publicly accessible for well-intentioned developers or researchers, but still in a way that's responsible in order to prevent open access to information to malicious parties who might be interested in making like very negative or very harmful software. That's a very good question. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the research that stimulates the imagination is in differential privacy, where we could make data sets that ha are effectively have some noise added to them so that it's not possible to, to say, remove one record and identif de identify some of the members of the data sets. But barring that eventual future, then you're right that you have to build trusting relationships that are based on values in your collaborations. And sometimes institutional values are explicit in, on one side of the partnership and not on the other. And that can be a labor-intensive process to, to build those. But once there is a clear articulation of shared values, I think it's, it helps to make these kinds of decisions as you move forward, because you can always refer back to these, this clear uh, expression of values. Okay, well, let's uh, thank our panel. This was a great session. <clears throat> and I think we meet up again at uh, 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Yep.